I'm joined now by Minister of Humanitarian and Poverty Elevation, Dr. Beta Edu, who joins us live from her Abuja office. Uh, Dr. Edu, the last time we spoke, you were National Women Leader of the APC. So let's begin by saying congratulations on your new appointment. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. All right, so the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs has been modified to include poverty elevation. And that's a good place to start because the president's statement on letting the poor breathe seems to have become quite popular now among many Nigerians. Recall that the National Bureau of Statistics did say over 130 million people are considered multidimensionally poor. And that was even before this government implemented the removal of health subsidies. So you have an idea of what the situation is right now. Have you been able to identify what it would take to deal with what is now called the world's poverty capital? And what's your strategy to executing the ministry's mandate in this regard? Thank you very much. I'm sure you know very well that um, one of the agendas of President Bola Ahmed Tinibu is to ensure that he eradicates poverty. And this is in line with the SDG goal one that says we must eradicate poverty by 2030. Um, the president is coming up with a very robust program and project to actually alleviate poverty um, in Nigeria. Uh, first, I would like to describe three situations that the ministry has to deal with. Number one, the over 16 million people who are affected by humanitarian crisis. About 8.3 of them are in the Bay states. That's Bruno, Ademowa, and Yubi state. And then a lot more others are in other states spread across the country, with the UN saying that Benue has become um, the humanitarian need capital in Nigeria. A lot of work has to be done in the humanitarian angle. And then when you look at the poverty alleviation angle, which is now the new and most important mandate of the ministry, our work is to see how we can get those who are in poverty out of poverty, and then those that are at the verge of getting into poverty increase the social safety net to be able to protect them from falling into poverty. Uh, you've mentioned the numbers already, and these numbers are um, actually what is obtainable um, in the country right now. A lot of work is being put into the planning stage. Um, we've finished the debriefing from the different departments and, of course, from the agencies under us. We are working assiduously to finalize the um, plans, strategies, which the president already laid out in his action plan, which we are expected to expand upon. In a couple of days or weeks from now, we'll be fully launching into this plan of President Bola Ahmed Tinibu to be able to take over 130 million persons out of poverty already. Implementations have started to cushion the effect of the full subsidy, which happened some three months ago. But beyond that, an actual robust plan to create jobs, to provide forms of livelihood, shelter, education, basic health care for the poor, agricultural startups, micro, um, small and medium-sized enterprises, ensure that we end hunger for real, provide food to people's doorstep, and in this support Nigerians at all levels. Remember, you had mentioned that it is multidimensional. So the cracks in any system or the failure of any part or gaps in any system, whether it's the educational sector or you go to the health sector or you go to security or the economy, leaves Nigerians on our plate or within the mandate right. of our ministry to handle. And that's what we're poised to do. Let us, let us attempt to peep into some of these plans. You talked about safety nets earlier. All eyes are now on the national social investment programs uh, designed by the uh, previous administration to lift families out of poverty and how it will be implemented under your leadership. It seems, from all indications, it's been adopted by this government. Uh, but some have criticized, for instance, the conditional cash transfer and even the homegrown school feeding program. They say the lack of transparency. Some even claim the programs have become some sort of a conduit pipe for corrupt officials to steal public funds. You have talked about reaching out to 15 million poor and vulnerable households through the cash conditional, the conditional cash transfer. What will you be doing differently? 
Okay, so um, one of the innovations which we're bringing in first is that on that social register, we are going to verify, validate, and expand it to accommodate more persons in the National Social Register and then from which we are going to get beneficiaries based on which intervention. Of course, we have said uh, working with the World Bank, we would be uh, seeking approval from the federal government to um, begin the cash transfer to Nigerians. Uh, that would, uh, the full information on that will come after we've gotten the clearance from the Federal Executive Council um, probably next week. But what is most important is that we want to increase the social safety net for Nigerians. We want to be able to pull millions of Nigerians out of poverty. And we're going to do it in a transparent manner. We are going to count the numbers together. You know the way, like I, I told them last time uh, during when we had the management meeting, I said, you know the way they count COVID cases and COVID debt associated with COVID and all of that? That's the same way we'll count the number of people we have been able to reach per day, per month, per time, and Nigerians would verify on their own, independent of the ministry, whether this has been truly done or not. We're going to digitalize the system. So it's going to hold you to account to that from promise. the banks to the beneficiaries without necessarily going through middlemen. But where that is not possible, for a very small percentage, will be flexible enough to ensure that everyone benefits from it and no one is left behind. Some critics have also claimed that, you know, components like market money, trader money, and what have you, have become mere gimmicks meant to secure more votes during elections. You are also coming aboard with a robust political background, saying what you did, uh, what you did pre-election. How do you ensure that this isn't skewed to favor members of your political party? So the interventions from President Bola Metinibu is not political and it's not gimmicks, right? We are very, very conscious of the fact that his passion and his true intention is to ensure that we can raise Nigerians out of poverty. And we're not looking at party or politics. We're done with that. Party politics is over. Now it's time for governance. He's the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, president over everyone in whatever party or whether you do not belong to any party, he's our president. And whatever um, transformational programs, projects that he's bringing on board is supposed to cover all Nigerians who fall within the limits uh, that should benefit from it. We are going to be very transparent, like I said, and we are removing some of the bottlenecks as well as shifting away some of the gray areas where things are not transparent enough for the public to follow alongside with us. Those are the things which we are working on right now. The final little tiny details that can help us achieve the result that we need to achieve. For things, uh, for programs that has not been helpful, programs that have not had the right outcome, programs that have not left us looking as transparent as we should, we would be putting them aside. Or we would be upgrading and, in fact, rejigging, bringing in new and more um, um, robust programs that will cover more Nigerians and would be more effective. For us, we don't even want to be telling our story as government. We want media, Nigerians to meet the people who have benefited and hear the story directly from them, get the evidence from them, not government speaking for itself. All right. Another important question to answer would be, how do you get your social register? And which of the registers will you be working with since the National Economic Council has, in a way, discarded the one used by the last administration? They say it has some flaws, uh, despite being produced in conjunction with the World Bank. Are you sticking with that uh, register, or you're planning to come up with a more acceptable version? So we're coming up with the more acceptable um, register, and that's why I'm saying the register must be verified, validated, and expanded to include those who should be there while taking off those who no longer belong within that um, bracket or that quintile in society. We'll take them off the list while those who should be there will put them there. Now, we are going to be working with governments, both at the state level, at the local government, and community targeting, community targeting, where community members will be part of the team that will be identifying these persons and putting them on 
on the register. However, they must be verifiable by just about anyone so that we are sure we're dealing with poor people who truly deserve this help. It's not going to be political, like I said. It's going to be pure governance, getting to the poor and getting them out of the situation where they find themselves. Well, there are some who would say that the register that we have was built by the State Minister of Planning and was only for, for, uh, facilitated by the National Social Safety Net Coordinating Office and that it was supported by the World Bank. I remember speaking with uh, some expert who said it's the finest uh, process that um, gave birth to that document. But we'll see what you do with it in the coming days. Let's take a short break, Honorable Minister, and, and we'll be back with more. Stay with us. You're watching First 100 Days, and I'm joined by the Honorable Minister of the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Alleviation, Dr. Beta Edu. Thank you for staying the course on the program. Dr. Edu, you're heading a high-level committee set up by the President to look into uh, the prevention, mitigation, as well as um, preferring solutions to flooding and its consequences. I'm wondering how Nigeria is responding differently this year to prevent the Perena flood disaster? So, of course, you know, uh, flood disasters are um, part of the natural disasters that lead to humanitarian crisis. Um, at the last Federal Executive Council meeting, I made a presentation to the President and, of course, the Chairman of the Federal Executive Council and members of the Federal Executive Council on um, the opening of the Lado Dam in Cameroon and its expected effect on Nigeria. I remember we've had lots of rain so far and um, the soil is actually saturated already with water, so any additional water uh, leads to flooding. In um, the past, we've experienced lots of flooding in different areas in Nigeria and um, really flooding is one of the most predictable um, natural disasters that occurs almost every year or seasonally in Nigeria. However, the response has not been um, properly coordinated and has not been really uh, very effective. Um, and that's due to uh, different stakeholders not playing their own role. Remember, it's not just a federal government um, response, but it's a response that goes all the way to the community and down to the individuals through the states and the local government. So states are supposed to work in collaboration with federal government ministries and their agencies to ensure that people get the right message on time and then people are evacuated, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, sometimes against their will, both their lives and, of course, the lives of their, uh, their livestock should be moved to higher planes. And then from time to time, on a regular basis, we need to do what we call sensitization advocacy as well as our own personal preparation as individuals and members of communities. We sit in communities where our drainages are blocked, where the big drainages are now becoming um, dust bin dumps and all of those kind of stuff, right? And we allow them to be blocked. When these rains come, what do you expect? They'll be flooding. When the rains come, what do, or even, even if there's an opening of a dam, what do you expect? There's re really no drainage to be able to take this um, water off uh, where we live and where we actually walk. So all of these are challenges that we've had in time past. Uh, persons being very reluctant to leave their uh, houses or leave their communities saying, this is my ancestral home, I belong here, you can't take me away. Well, sometimes it's temporal obvious. and sometimes we can prevent it. So we yeah, want we to continue the sensitization and work with yes. the state governments, the local governments, and even the community to ensure that we can prevent, number one, prevent 
and then, of course, mitigate and reduce the loss that is associated uh, with all of this flooding. But we believe with the sensitization that is going on, the work NEMA is doing, and several other uh, ministries, line ministries uh, that are part of this, Ministry of Environment, uh, that have to give all the warnings and the alerts. Um, of course, uh, Ministry of Water Resources, which we expect to profile um, uh, more long-term solutions like building buffer dams and the rest of it in those areas that are prone to flood and different other MDAs that are all working together with us, even those who will be helping when the flood occurs. Remember, we'll be working with both um, the Navy and the Air Force on rescue missions when flood occurs to reduce the number of lives that have been lost. So it's a full national coordinating team, which is beyond any agency right. or ministry. And we're working hard with the states for them to play their own role. Sometimes the state governments sit back and say, look, um, the national loan is supposed to intervene in this. We're depending on you. We're relying on you. It should not happen that way. There's a lot you can do. You can provide transit areas, holding areas for persons who are affected by flood. And the rest of it, these are collaborations that must happen. And we're beginning we're to work. We're looking forward to that collaboration and also seeing... Uh, the extent to which government will march words with action. As we speak, even before the opening of the Lagdo Dam in Cameroon, some communities across the country are already uh, suffering from flash floods. There are questions of, does this government have a blueprint design uh, uh, to ensure that um, we don't build on floodplains, uh, to ensure that we'll also create a structure and reclaim some of these lands permanently from from these flood areas. But we're running out of time now, Honorable Minister. Quickly, at 23,000, we're told Nigeria has the highest number of missing persons in Africa, and that's according to the ICRC. You spoke about that recently, and I know that we've attributed the number to insurgency in the north. But what specifically would this government be doing about it? I think it's an area which is quite new, and we're working with RCRC to develop um, policies as well as implement them to be able to reduce the number of persons who suddenly disappear. Um, it's a thing of, uh, it's a very painful thing for lots of families and um, indeed their friends where you just wake up and for one reason or the other, you don't get to see your loved ones anymore. So this is simply, the, the yesterday's um, event was to actually advocate and bring attention to the facts that we have of, or up to that number of persons who actually disappear and nobody can really tell where did they go to, what happened, and the rest of it. Of course, we have a full work to do in developing policies and action plans that will help us out of the wood and then working with the security agencies, individuals, and communities to overcome all of this. We're hearing about a presidential humanitarian and um, poverty alleviation trust fund. What's it about and what can Nigerians expect from it? Okay, it's a new innovation by the president, President Bola Ahmed Tinibu. It's yet to be launched, but that would happen almost immediately. We will begin our negotiations and lobbying at the level of Ongar and several other levels. We've started um, already meeting with different key stakeholders that would be part of that um, whole trust fund. So basically, it's a fund that is dedicated to humanitarian services and poverty alleviation in Nigeria. And we are not going to be depending on only government funds um, from the budget allocation, but we're looking beyond that. How can we get the private sector fully involved, just the way they came in in terms of COVID during the COVID-19 pandemic? How can we get them fully involved in humanitarian response and poverty alleviation? We're also looking at getting development partners. Today, we spoke with Bill Amelie and the Gates Foundation and their leadership, and we'll be making presentations on this uh, trust fund at Seattle very soon. We've also engaged with other countries like Greece, Netherlands, the USA, and several other countries. This is to call for that um, contribution to the trust fund to help us uh, be able to respond adequately to humanitarian needs as well as ensuring that we reach our targets of um, lifting um, 
Nigerians out of poverty and eradicating poverty for real. So it's like saying government would not do this alone or cannot do this alone. Government does not have enough resources to do that on its own, but we'll be getting support from both the private sector, donor agencies, um, individuals, oh, foundations. Just to get and some clarification, Honorable Minister. Resource mobilization just to get some clarification. There's a 500 billion annually allocated to the NSIP. Um, is this money going to be added for the national social investment program? So it will be used for a completely different program. So the National Social Investment Program is actually being rejigged, like I said earlier on. So we're changing a lot of things. We're bringing in new innovations, taking off what did not work, and we're expanding the scope to be more robust, to com uh, cover more Nigerians. So it, it's a complete uh, um, uh, um, overhauling of the entire system to ensure that it's more accountable, more transparent, and it covers more Nigerians. So we expect this and even more from what we'll be getting from the trust fund. So poverty elevation is big for Nigeria, being called the poverty capital of the world, over 100 million people uh, in poverty and you are sitting at the middle of it. So Nigerians are counting on you. I will wish you all the best, Dr. Edu. Thank you for talking to TVC News. Thank you for having me.